Hi, and welcome to today's episode of The Focus. And we have the honor of having Andreas Dreschler um, joining us today, and he will be introducing himself a little bit later. I'm Aldu. And, and I'm Horia. Welcome. So we're going to jump right in there, and I'm going to explain why Andreas is a guest on The Focus today. Now, I've met Andreas uh, through the PMI and various uh, PMI discussion and forums uh, a few years ago. And when Andreas heard that we were actually doing the, res uh, the research, our initial research, he was part of the original panel um, that we that he sat in on one of the on, on many of the sessions. So that's why I've in, we've invited him back. Um, but there's also a a hidden surprise in here is that Andreas is also a researcher. He's a, he's a, he's a PhD graduate and he's actually researching along very similar lines of what we've been doing with adaptive oversight. But I'm not going to tell you more about that all up front. Let's give Andreas an opportunity to share a little bit of his own background, his, share his river of life with us. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me here to the podcast. I'm happy to be here. Um, so I'm originally uh, from uh, Germany and I've moved to, to New Zealand in uh, 2016. I'm an academic at Victoria University of uh, Wellington um, in the information systems field. And as um, Alu has said, uh, one of my research interests at the moment is to look how the new ways of working, so uh, things like scale agile, uh, how things uh, or how, how um, organizations are sort of tackling established issue, issues when, when everything sort of changes around them. So if there's no business and no, no kind of IT anymore, but I think we'll sort of get to that uh, a bit later. Originally, um, I had my first career in sort of, sort of tech software development, starting with the first dot-com boom in parallel uh, to my studies of, of information systems. And over time, because in, in my studies, there was also a bit of a component of sort of management, management content. Uh, and then I learned that in uh, software development, you have, you have sort of, um, certainly a number of uh, wicked problems to, to deal with, but the really wicked problems are in management. Uh, and so I sort of pivoted <laughs> over time into, into, into that direction, uh, took some further courses, also, also sort of deep dive and also in my research into sort of management, management theory, organizational theory, and, and the under, underlying sort of mechanisms, why organizations work, how they work, and uh, what, what the typical challenges are. And this uh, sort of um, still combined with my focus uh, on any, anything digital uh, leads then to, the, to this nice intersection to understand the new way of working in, in the digital age uh, but also then uh, having at least a at least a bit of a grasp of of the underlying sort of mechanisms uh, of why and how organizations work or doesn't work and uh, then of course uh, when i've been involved in um, doing research on things like service management governance architecture over a while then suddenly it's interesting what if if you take away the sort of basic foundations uh, of here is business uh, and the, on the other side is is it and these two worlds don't understand each other uh, so when you put all those folks into the same teams uh, to, to work on products and services. What's actually changing? What's new? And what's what's the same old, just in a new guise? And that's uh, sort of the the, the high-level line uh, of our inquiry in, into these phenomena. Well, thank you. Uh, and um, you, you're talking about a deep dive into the non-technology aspects and hacking the, the human operating system and how that works in, in organizations. Yep. That's quite a big can of worms to uh, to dive into. I hope you had a good fork or a good spoon to to get into that. And um, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about <clears throat> the current research that you're doing? And you've hinted at that a little bit. And we know that you've been busy with research into the future of IT governance and business. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, yeah. So. In the past, um, so many of uh, the efforts in research and also in the actual practice to make organizations work was how to overcome 
this, this kind of chasm between business on the one hand and IT on the other hand, and many of the management instruments that uh, have been invented for that. So things like IT governance, IT service management, um, were mainly focused on doing that. Um, and then we uh, always keeping an eye on new developments uh, in, in, the, in the industry. And then one thing we, we've done that, and if I say we, um, we're teamed together with uh, some uh, so colleagues from uh, Germany. Um, and uh, then if, if we take away these sort of fundamental tenets around how we've been organizing uh, the use uh, of IT, in organizations and the and the, and the development of IT that's useful uh, for the business. What happens to all these established wisdoms uh, if you take away these two these two these two essential pillars? Um, and um, so there is there there is one saying from the management literature that I really like is every uh, management techniques creates its own nemesis. So meaning <laughs> when you um, find a, a new framework or a new approach, a new technique to manage a challenge, then uh, even if, it, if it's excellent in addressing that challenge, you always incur some kind of unwanted side effects, some additional uh, sort of problems as a follow-up, and you're never really done organizing. Um, and uh, that's, that's one of the things um, uh, that sort of always sort of fascinated me, the, the emergence of new challenges once you thought you, you solved your old ones. And this happens on a small scale. Um, so for instance, if, if you introduce or ha have introduced in the past, your um, established IT service management framework, then there were always changes. So you needed something like a continuous improvement process to keep um, um, your, your established processes up to date. Uh, so that was this, this of a, uh, a phenomenon in the small. And now we have this on a larger scale, if you take away, um, these sort of basic silos of business and IT and put them all into um, uh, teams, uh, then you have suddenly just the challenge how to organize these teams as the new silos, so to speak, uh, that you still have one organization and the synergy between the teams, et cetera. Um, so the essence uh, of um, what we found is you still face the same challenges, including the, the oversight, uh, just everything gets gets a new spin, uh, and you're basically just trading one set of challenges that were, I think, largely solved through the established uh, sort of frameworks over the past 10, 20 years uh, in the field of service management, service management governance, etc., uh, for a new set of challenges to deal with the new VUCA world, which of course uh, is then the uh, or the one big impetus uh, why the old ways of working may not may not be appropriate anymore. Uh, and you have to make this a paradigm shift. And uh, then, of course, you end up with uh, lots of detailed questions to look at. So what happens uh, to business IT alignment when you don't have business and IT anymore to align? What happens uh, to um, enterprise architecture when you don't have don't need sort of sort of someone to bridge the business architecture and the IT architecture worlds, or what happens to IT governance when it's not about aligning IT to the business governance anymore? You still have these governance challenges, but they all take new new shapes. And then it's of course interesting to do a deep dive into each of each of those topics, um, and then uh, find out what what um, as successful organizations are doing, how can you distill this into something a bit more generalized, and then would this also work for, for other organizations? Mm. I just want to rewind a little bit to, to something you said a little bit earlier and, and something you, you, you've alluded to. And it's this phenomenon is that the solutions we had, yesterday's solutions or today's problems, the, the sort of uh, thinking uh, around that, um, but what comes with that as well is, is that um, in the past, we, we have had um, a specific uh, set of rules, especially with oversight, to, for the organization or the teams to do things in a specific way. And there were real good reasons for that. But the reasons have moved on. The reasons have been removed, but we're still clinging on to those uh, rules. And in many cases, we find that many organizations can't explain why they 
still have those rules or those things that the teams need to do or the organizations need to do. Um, how how prevalent do you think uh, that is in in organizations as part of your research? I think very, and I think actually I might might have uh, at least one sort of partial answer to that. Um, so if you go back to the roots of what is organizing, mm. organizing basically is you assume the world is reasonably stable. You have a certain task that's reasonably stable and you um, find uh, a rather efficient way of executing that task in the stable world. That in a nutshell is where most of our current organizing comes from. So Taylorism, um, um, assembly line production, where the task doesn't change unless mm. uh, you want to produce a new Ford Model T. Um, and uh, the, the tasks aren't so too difficult. So any worker could do it to, to an extent uh, if you go back to basic Taylorism. And uh, the key is then the division of labor and the, the so possibility to, to scale things that you need a few people or only a few people to oversee a lot of uh, uh, workers. Um, and that has worked in the manufacturing industry for so, uh, at least a couple decades. Um, and this is still the basic tenet of organizing. You organize for efficiency, you organize for stability, you organize for a repeatability. And slowly over time, with the shift more towards knowledge work, with the shifts uh, more towards the unpre unpredictability of the task, um, these basic foundations of why we organize and how we organize have been sort of taken away. And so if, if you go to the extreme uh, that you have an entirely new digital market and you're inventing entirely new new digital products uh, on uh, sort of cutting edge technology, then little of these assumptions that have, have held true for over a century in the Taylorist production still hold true, but we don't have any other established way of organizing. So whenever we organizing, and that, that includes organizing oversight, um, we still have this often unspoken assumption, and mm. that's, what, that's what you said, organizations don't know why they cling to those rules. Uh, that's because that's the um, a single, single dominant paradigm of organizing for over a century. And that's what everyone has learned uh, in their studies, that what all the, all the textbooks mm. assume, if they, if they don't, sort of, don't sort of spell it out. And... Uh, you may have sort of go to uh, some of some of the more reflective research papers where um, researchers actually uh, do a reflection on these assumptions and try to unpack them that you that you organize for stability. And that's one one thing actually we found across all the different things we looked at. Um, what um, could make sense now in many cases is not to organize for stability, but to mm. organize for fluidity for yes. change for the unpredictability. And then of course, you basically throw out a lot of established management wisdom uh, that we have, have accumulated over the last century. And you have then new challenges where no one has a good idea how to tackle them, what would mm -hmm. work, what would work across more than one organization, how to sort of generalize from that and uh, how to go forward. So we're at the moment basically relearning how to organize uh, in, in this way. And of course, you get a lot of friction then between the um, established ways that don't really fit and the new ways that are rather uh, sort of nascent in, in, in their maturity. Uh, and a, a lot of things are in flux. And that's something humans aren't really good at sort of coping with, um, yeah. being uh, not sure what the, what the actual work environment is and how they're managed or how they can sort of manage themselves and whether they are actually um, uh, allowed to do that or encouraged to do that. So that's, that's, that's the other part potentially of the, the, another missing piece of that puzzle that we're talking about is the human operating system and how it perceives change. Um, so uh that's uh that's what my thinking is is that that, that that's that's another piece of the puzzle in, in this respect so yeah i think there's there is, there is, there is uh, the one saying the only person who likes change is a baby in wet diapers 
uh, and this is probably not entirely true, but it holds a certain grain of truth. And uh, so and if we go back to do more serious research, there is something that's called stable zones so that every sort of human being needs some sort of anchor, some sort of mm. stability in their environment, which includes uh, their work environment as well. And uh, everyone also has their own appetite or their own their their own capacity to deal with with the uncertainty with 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 change uh, and then um if if you if you add to that uh then uh across all people in organization then there's also a limited change capacity or change appetite in the entire organization um and uh, so you can't simply so sort of flick a switch uh, and say uh we are going to do things entirely different starting tomorrow um even though uh on a ideal world this is what an organization might need if they so sort of slept through a little bit of change needs uh, this doesn't really work so it's more like sort of starting starting that journey uh, towards organizing for change and fluidity i wonder if i could offer a challenge sure. um you were um hypothesizing that um we're not really sure how to organize for fluidity and change and what comes to mind for me is in some areas of life we actually deliberately train and prepare for fluidity and change so if you think for instance of first responders of um, special forces of uh, various kinds they deliberately train and train and train and train for the unexpected what happens if uh, there's a uh, bunkered position over there? What happens if, uh, oh, it's not just one, but two casualties uh, over here? And you train and train and train and deliberately uh, get so good that you can deal, um, I won't call it comfortably, but capably uh, with whatever the situation throws at you. Now, the challenge, I suppose, is that on the one hand, this works well in small ultra high performance uh, communities but when you have to do that across vast numbers of people oh, that's hard yeah because not everybody has the same kind of intensely proactive and um, deeply focused intention of excellence um, so the challenge there is how do we make it more uh, attractive and capable and possible for more people to experience that kind of joy that comes out of thriving in the unknown, so to speak, because um, there's something tremendously um, exhilarating in overcoming adversity and um, having uh, daunting obstacles and prevailing. So that I think is something quite, quite fascinating to consider um, because there, we're, we're calling on people in position of authority to consider a different approach to leadership. So what attracted you to um, this area of oversight? Um, so basically, as a, as a, as a um... I mentioned before, uh, thing things like emergence or so always something that has sort of fascinated me, and that uh, but also think among the reasons uh, why I went from uh, the more technical side to the more organizational side. And here, this is then just an instance uh, where, um, yeah, Im or, yeah, where this this kind of emergence is then more the norm. Um, and the, there is there is there is one quote from. Um, a leader of a big organization, I don't recall who it was, uh, during, during the last financial crisis where they said, uh, we, we always had our long-term plans, but now during the start of the financial crisis, we're flying on site. Um, and my thought was, um, you've always been flying on site. Now just you actually notice it, that the future is going to be unpredictable due to the financial crisis, but the future has always been unpredictable. Just our established management models um, and uh, the management structures have been sort of good at sort of cushioning that. And the uncertainty wasn't that high that you actually had vast differences between your projections uh, and what about actually happened all the time. So it's more, 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 more of a gradual shift. And I think that's I think also now that our world hasn't just become from stable on one day to VUCA uh, on, on the next, it's sort of gradual. Um, and um, it has simply reached a level where many organizations feel that the current way 
or the a traditional way of working isn't isn't adequate anymore. So they have to do something different and not just tweak their management models. Um, and I think that's where why some sort of um, a move towards adopting um, the scaled agile approach in one guise or the or the other as sort of one potential answer um, to that problem. And of course, it was also a bit of a hype. Uh, that's that's the other facets uh, sort of management fashions, uh, which don't have to be bad all the time. Uh, there is a reason why they exist. Uh, of course, there is always something like the overhype, and there is a reason why the hype cycle uh, looks looks like this. Um, but you always, uh, unless something is um, sort of totally unfit for purpose, you always get this sort of uh, a plateau of productivity. In the end, the question is how big is is the difference uh, over the sort of starting position. Very good, thank you, Andreas. There's quite a lot to unpack there, and uh, uh, but I want to move on to my next question. So you've already, when I asked you to talk a little bit about the research that you're busy currently working with, um, you've alluded to some problems, but what are the key problems uh, that your research are focusing on? Um, so basically, um, and that was one pattern that that had has. Um, hold true across the different topics we've been looking at. So what happens to, to architecture or architecting in the new world? What happens mm. to alignment? What happens uh, to governance and, and oversight? Um, that you change the basic way how organizations are built. So traditionally, uh, many organizations have had some sort of functional organization. So uh, you have business operations here, you have finance there, you have IT development, you have IT operations uh, and some, some, some other functions. And of course, this, this looks different uh, for any organization, but you have the basic sort of types of um, uh, functions uh, in, in, in most places. And then the established management frameworks were there to bridge the gaps, to to get these different parts of organizations talk to each other. And the new way um, was then for many organizations to sort of break these barriers and to put more people together. So either in the small, so going uh, towards DevOps uh, that you have the same sort of um, a group of people building systems and then so running them, integrating security, DevSecOps, bring the business people to the same table as well. So biz DevSecOps. Um, and then of course you're losing more and more of the environment you've built many management structures for. And then the question is, okay, how do we then introduce oversight over these new ways of organizing and the, and the new underly underlying culture. So you're getting shorter time horizons, uh, which mm. may clash with established yearly uh, cycles of portfolio management and allocating resources, budget, et cetera. And then you get these uh, follow-up changes in other parts of the organizations that also have to keep up with, or they have to manage the sort of friction between uh, where you still have lots of established ways of working and the new ways of working. And that's always interesting for us because then there are new sort of questions we can we can ask. How are organizations coping with this? What works and what doesn't? And the natural bias, of course, means that mostly the, the successful organizations talk to us and the others don't get back to us. Um, <laughs> and uh, so what, what we happen to get usually are cases of uh, where at least organizations think that things worked. Uh, and when we get enough, then we get enough in, in our, enough different perspectives to see, is there something where we can generalize, even if it's on a very high level, uh, either in form of a number of general principles or one sort of major, major so sort of big picture that sort of covers, covers the main aspects. Uh, and then we, of course, feed this back to organizations and say, this is what we found. Is this useful for you in your way of moving forward? Thank you for that. Um, can I uh, just have a quick uh, definition of what yeah. you mean uh, you, you talk about uh, architectural thinking uh, in there. What is your definition of architectural thinking in, in, in the, the uh, key problems that you've described? So architectural thinking, um, what, what, what we understand with this is having um, a holistic view across the entire organization, how the goals and strategy, business people and business operations, the data that they use, 
the applications that they use in the processes to fulfill the purpose and then the the infrastructure that you need to run uh, the applications how here everything hangs together so that you're building processes to reach your business goals to deliver business value that you have the data that you need that you have applications that 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 are um a fit for purpose and then infrastructure that that can run the application so this holistic view um you would have some specialists for all, all these parts um but also it's useful to have someone to have the grasp of the the entire uh, uh five five layers of, of of architecture and um in the past this has been to bridges of business worlds and the it worlds uh, and now if you have more independent teams uh, working on their part but with all the skills in there then every team has their own end-to-end -end architecture and then it's more a matter of laterally um how they can leverage synergies or not sort of deploy everything at the same time so you're looking between the interface here between system architecture and business architecture yeah. okay thanks for clarifying that um so by being able to focus on these key problems what's been the the major trends that you've been uh, noticing in your research one is definitely the one I've already mentioned before. So the shift um, from organizing for stability to organizing for mm. change. And this was not something that came out immediately. That was more <clears throat> after we were through that this was a sort of a higher, higher level pattern that, that emerged um, so that these organizations were able to um, I throw out these fundamental unspoken assumptions why we organize and uh, how we have organized in the past and find new ways of embracing change so in the past change has always been an exception so you have one have one um, sort of task and one environment you optimize for in terms of efficiency and uh, in terms of stability and then any change is an exception so you probably all know the established model of unfreeze change refreeze mm. And uh, whereas now it's uh, um, either very, very short uh, episodes of that, or rather it's an ongoing continuous change and change in an acceptable doses um, shall be uh, the new norm. And how can we organize that to get the change happen? And um, um, so to, to remove the blockers for, for that change, but at the same time, not overwhelming. Uh, the organizations or, or mm. individuals with with that change and keeping everyone on board and not losing the main purpose out of sight so to, to deliver uh, at the maximum value to the customers which in turn means the maximum value returned to the organization because that's the main purpose and not not the change I want to dive a little bit deeper into what you just said about moving from organizing for stability into moving or organizing for fluidity and change. Now, I've got a, a slide deck that you shared with us a, a little bit earlier here. And, and one thing I'm noticing on there is that when you're organized for stability, you and these are the terms that you've used on the slide is that you've got alignment, you've got governance and you've got architecture as opposed to when you're organized for fluidity of change, you've got aligning, you've got governing, and you've got architecturing. So it seems that there's a move from um, roles to capabilities. Is, is that the underlying um, the trend here? Yeah, so, and again, being a bit, a bit uh, uh, on, on the academic side here, so language usually shapes how we see the world and how we uh, are then poised to understand the world. And if you say architecture or alignment or governance, then this implies the stability. So if you use the metaphor of, of, of house architecture, uh, this usually doesn't change over the life of a building unless you do some kind of huge remodeling. Uh, and when you use when you say architecture or alignment, here is one stable state where the business and the IT are in alignment, and this implies um, a certain level of stability. Whereas if you if you say architecting or governing or aligning, then this implies this is a continuous task. You'll never be done. Mm. And of course, you always or you don't want to put too much sort of resource into that because I said the main purpose of an organization is not to align itself with with itself, uh, but rather to produce something useful uh, 
uh, for the customer. It's just as a means to be able to do that and not to fall behind that there's an ongoing task. And that's how we attempted to put this into the actual terms that we are using to convey that there are a different set of underlying assumptions. And then the main challenge for organizations is then to sort of spell this out in their actual oversight processes, in their actual alignment processes, in their actual architecting, um, how they can achieve this sort of balance between um, being on the lookout for changes, embracing changes when necessary, but mm. still retaining enough efficiency nonetheless uh, to be um, so uh, good at what they're doing. So both the effectiveness and efficiency uh, as opposed to change. But it also implies uh, not maintaining a static skill set or capability. It's, um, it's the intent to continuously evolve that capability. Um, yep. Just look at where project managers were 10 years ago to where project management is today. Um, it, and, and that distinction I find quite fascinating uh, in, in the language. When you talk about um, the, the capability instead of the job description, um, it changes the whole dynamic around uh, change management and, and so on. Um, I found that interplay in organizations quite interesting. And the yep. more you emphasize the latter, the more people uh, understand that change is not a snap of the finger, but it's a gradual, it's a continuous uh, effect. So, yep. And the but, the other the other level of, sort of mastery, is, uh, so to speak, is the so-called ambidextrous organization who can mm. both explore and exploit at the same time. So that's not either or. So that I think was was one phenomenon. Um, uh, in the past where you had small agile digital business units with tasks with innovating quickly, coming up with new products. And then once they've reached the mature prototype stage, they would then sort of uh, put this back into the big organization um, so that you have one small unit for the explore. And then you would try to exploit this in your established structures, which uh, in, in many cases probably has worked, but also then you have a certain dedicated point for friction uh, when you get these, these sort of mature prototypes uh, handed over to uh, the established organization, which are used to uh, large scale stable information systems. And then how do you manage this, this, this kind of transition? Um, and then the next uh, level here is then to um, have both capabilities of explore and exploit, uh, ideally within the same team, so that they are always encouraged to, to uh, explore how they can improve their service and product further. But at the same time, they don't lose the capability to actually run, the, run their shop efficiently and effectively uh, what the customer wants uh, and doing so in a competitive way. Yeah. So, I find it. Uh, go, Aurea. Um, I find it fascinating this idea of why do we have to explore and exploit at the same time because in the past you usually let's say you're a farrier um, and you're making horseshoes therefore that's your purpose in life you make horseshoes and horses being horses they don't change much uh, the technology of the horseshoe is what it is uh, usually um, you just keep going with whatever it is that you've been been, been doing. So there's very little innovation uh, to be had. Um, the <sighs> way of putting together a horseshoe, the way of affixing a horseshoe, it kind of stays put. Whereas what we have these days, particularly with knowledge intensive work, all of a sudden the context of uh, the tools, the services, the products changes dramatically. So um, therefore, by inventing uh, a new way, uh, like uh, this platform of the smartphone, for instance, it gave rise to an enormous array of possibilities. So therefore, we cannot afford to just exploit um, the same pattern in the same context because the context keeps changing. So therefore, we need to be prepared to innovate. So um, whether we like it or not, if we try to fight uh, and say, no, 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 uh, our organization is of a massive scale, we're just going to um, milk the cow, so to speak, and um, get the, uh, the result and just sell, you know, like um, Mr. Ford, originally saying you can have any color as long as it's black for the Ford Model T. 
Now, these days, we could imagine that you could have a one-off custom service. Uh, in other words, pure uh, craftsmanship, uh, sort of back to the, the olden days, but delivered with rapidity. So the intention would be, again, have a really customized experience. You get a, a product, a service that's just right for you, for now, for this initiative, but that requires a lot of capability. And it's not so much a matter of exploit because you make many things of the same, it's more innovate. You make um, a, a one offer, a very small limited run of something very, very specific. What are your thoughts in this space? I think there are two, two main factors at, at least at, at work compared to the, to the horseshoe. Um, one is I was a digital, um, product which has a number of, of implications. So one thing uh, for many digital products, you, ha you have a global market, um, or even uh, if it's something more local, so let's say the banking app, um, it's not that hard to switch banks if uh, one bank in your country has a much better app than, than the other. Uh, at least I personally don't have that much of a loyalty to my bank, although they're doing a pretty good job. Um, and then, uh, so, it's the side of, of the digital product that they are much more fungible. Uh, in the past, you had your one uh, so horseshoe maker and you would have to ride pretty far to find another one. Uh, whereas here, it's just the one, one sort of click away um, with the digital product. It's also much easier to innovate. You simply sort of build a product on a focus group, maybe, maybe, maybe throw on the market, expect it to fail, and then you're happy when it actually works and people are willing to pay for that new digital service or product, and then you can keep iterating. And when your expectation is met that it fails, okay, throw away, try, try something else, find out what, what the customer wants. And that's the other new big dynamic um, that, so that is so the, the saying is so true again, the customer is of king or queen. Um, which uh, in, back in the day of the Ford Model T, they were happy that there was one car that they could actually afford and the, the sort of color was the, was the least of, of their concerns. But it soon as there were more stylish cars or more cars with more colors in roughly the same price range or at least affordable, um, then suddenly the Model T wasn't the, the answer to everything anymore. And that's of course true these days that the customers uh, have a very easy time to sort of gravitate towards the best digital service, uh, either on the uh, entirely global market or on, on, on your local market. And they're also uh, willing to, to move much more quickly. And it's not that much effort to, to move things. Um, and uh, so I think that's the two, or at least two of, of the particular forces uh, that, that make up the, this additional layer of sort of VUCA uh, for, for every organization. And uh, the third thing, maybe the rise of startups who are willing to try new things. So uh, FinTech as probably the best example uh, that put, put the fear into the established big banks, uh, what's their business going to be? Or if we stay with the example of the car, that it's not in the future, probably less about the car itself, uh, but more about the service of mobility. And uh, there are things like color or, things uh, like, like horsepower doesn't really matter, but rather who has the best app knowing where the traffic jam is going to be and providing you the, you the route around. Um, and uh, so that you are more so quickly there where, where you want or need to be uh, instead of having the coolest, flashiest car, which probably always uh, may sort of play a role and there will always be a market for that. But I think the sort of main consumer, if they say I'm on average 10 minutes earlier, uh, where I want to be, then this is the argument to go for manufacturer X or for software X that you can load on any car uh, than for manufacturer Y or for, or for software vendor Y. Mm. So that's in two of these external mechanisms that sort of triggered organizations. Okay, uh, we can't just uh, do the same thing we've always done as efficiently as it may be if, if, if others are doing or offering a much better product for uh, roughly the, the same price, uh, then we're not going to be around for much longer. Yeah. And it's fascinating how this has such an impact on the uh, product and service strategy in particular, right? Because... That's the thing, one, sorry, sorry one, one, one other thing um, that doesn't make it always easy for us to be clear about what we're talking about in our research papers, is it a product or a service or both? Because these lines are also sort of blurring. 
Um, so again, it's not the horseshoe. It's about keeping your horse with, yeah, enough horseshoes. I don't know the term here. Uh, and uh, that's of course an, Shod, an entire service. Basically, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that that's the so service thing around many of those products, and that that the car or uh, the construction tool doesn't really matter. It's more like uh, having the the service of mobility or the service of construction management, and then the tool is intelligent and simply helps helps you doing that. Also, keeping track of what it is supposed to be doing or what its uh, wielder is as supposed to be doing. Mm. In your uh, uh, slide deck that you shared with us, uh, based on your research, you talk about uh, an ecosystem for co-evolution governing. Can you can you uh, explain that a little bit more? Yeah, so that's uh, our, our current working term, probably not, not final because it's a bit unwieldy, um, but um, where we sort of try to, to to find a replacement term for IT governance. Yeah. Because you don't need IT governance anymore if IT is fused into the business in one way or another. And as we had before, it's not about governance. It's more about the ongoing way of governing, finding the best way yeah. of having the oversight. And so the, the next logical step upwards from IT would be enterprise governance, but A, that already exists, and B, based on what we just talked about, it's not just enough to look inwards, as many of those management approaches have done. Um, so in business IT alignment, you don't, you basically just let the so business part worry about the what about happens outside the organization and your focus is on aligning your internal IT to your internal business or the enterprise architecture also in its term you start at the business strategy and then go down uh, into the in the internals um, but um, through this um, what we just talked about it's more about the business ecosystem so to look a, at your entire supply chain. So the partners, mm -hmm. uh, your uh, suppliers and their suppliers, uh, if you don't sell to the, to the, to the end customer, um, who are, um, are your customers customers or what is a platform you're, you're active in? Uh, what, what are your competitors doing? Can it make sense to actually team up with some of your competitors for something in particular so that you two or three can overtake the rest uh, by, by sharing efforts? Um, what about if, 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 if that's relevant, in, increased um, compliance regulations, et cetera. So it's almost as important as the looking inwards is to look outwards into everything around in your organization, getting a feel where the entire market is heading. How long will this market actually exist? Or uh, can mm -hmm. we sort of create our own new market with our own new innovative product? And that's something um, we... I try to capture with the ecosystem term. So you could say ecosystem architecture and even keep the acronym EA. Um, and you can say ecosystem, ecosystem governing instead of IT, IT governance. And then the uh, co-evolution, that's actually one of the other sort of patterns we've, we've, we've seen across uh, the different areas we, we looked at. Uh, so it's not just top down and it's not just bottom up. It's in, it's in all directions. Um, so um, those um, in these product or, or, or service teams, they know their market best. They may not know best all markets where the organization is, is active if it's, a, if, if it's a large organization. Um, so they have to exchange views uh, with the senior leadership team, which probably will still exist uh, to make sure that, that all, these auto, all, the, all these autonomous teams are at least somewhat in line and they have to have have to distribute um, the the resources um, that are always going to be finite, and uh, then the teams. Uh, but it, it will also 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 be top down. That's uh, uh, from a sort of collective view across the entire organization. Some new directions uh, at least should be explored actively by by the teams, and then uh, also then so laterally between teams that they uh, if they start to overlap uh, based on uh, where they're heading from from where from where they're starting from that they at least do this in an aligned fashion mm -hmm. uh, and don't start sort of cannibalizing uh, it, itself. And that's the sort of co-evolution part um, that this applies to the products and services, but also to the management infrastructure and the, and the oversight infrastructure um, that changes to that shouldn't just be top down 
and mm. can't just can't certainly be be so sort of just bottom up. So this is also then then a process uh, that sort of both sides give or all sides give give impulses. So again, not just top down, bottom up, but also sort of sort of sort of, sort of um, but. Uh, between teams uh, that that others might have a better idea that might also be then working for for other teams as well and that's then the, the third term which unfortunately makes the whole phrase a bit unwieldy so uh, it's it's a sort of, it sort of covers everything we so sort of wanted to cover but it may not be the most catchy so we're still working on that and one thing that keeps coming to mind as you were explaining to this is i could not not think of uh, complex adaptive system theory as well as value networks, because you you're not you, you you're talking about the phenomenon of value networks uh, as well. Um, so that and and that's a whole a whole new trend uh, as well. Um, we explored some of that with one of our previous um, uh, interviewers, um, Al Shalloway, uh, and there's probably quite a lot more that we can explore around how oversight would work in this context of a value network that spans organizations and uh, this whole ecosystem so really that was actually one sorry that was actually one one thing back when we did the interviews uh in in 2019 where most of our interviewees seem to struggle with uh what is value what is a value stream so oh, not even yeah. talking about value <laughs> networks and uh, what does it mean for how we organize ourselves um and that was, I think, one of the other patterns that uh, everything uh, should be following uh, the value. And that's ultimately the, the, the purpose of everything to increase the, the provided value to the customer, which in turn mean, hopefully means if you, if you do things right, more value for the, for the organization. Um, and then um, where, well, what's the, the natural limit to explore, exploit uh, that you, don't invest too much into exploring so that you start neglecting exploiting and the actual value coming in because that's what ultimately what keeps the whole organization alive and purposeful on this topic i have a suspicion that we have misled ourselves we've uh, focused on something that's not quite right uh, what i mean by that is most of the time when we say value we focus on value to the organization. In other words, very much um, uh, what's in it for us, as opposed to when we think of value, we ought to be thinking um, more systemically. In other words, first and foremost, what's in it for the customer? Because if I don't pay attention closely to what's in it for the customer, then uh, pretty soon the customer is going to go elsewhere and I'm not having a customer. Uh, there's that classic saying that the purpose of a, of a business is to make a customer. Um, yeah. So essentially, if we think of value, and when I say value, you hear in the back, in the back of my voice, uh, the clinking of coins, um, then um, I'm looking at value primarily from a fiscal uh, perspective. And that, I think, is a mistake. Because in many areas of life, um, it's nigh on impossible to put um, value on them, right? So there's great value in, in connection. There's great value in relaxation and um, refreshment. And you can't easily uh, put a dollar value and say, I'll either have my body well refreshed or $57, right? It's like, mm, no, it doesn't, doesn't fit. Yeah. And then you have the whole social sector um, various governmental and non-governmental organizations that are aiming at various um, social and environmental benefits for all of us in our communities, in our countries, uh, and across the globe. And that, again, um, it requires money to, to operate, but it's not about money. It's about uh, thriving humans in an ecosystem that uh, is sustainable and, and enjoyable. Yeah. So we're, we're hoping to, um, to get better, yeah? So essentially, um, we have to figure out um, how do we talk about value in a manner that's more precise? Because too often, 
different people have different views on value. If I'm an engineer, I value the um, cleanliness of the code, the um, um, well-managed technical debt, and so on. If I'm um, a, a quality specialist, I care about various aspects of quality. Uh, if I'm um, a professional interested in analysis, uh, I want other things about sort of the, the, the clarity of expression of requirements and so on. So different people have different perspectives on value. They come at value from different perspectives. And I find that too often we get misalignment mm -hmm. in our uh, approach to, to value. What thoughts do you have in this space? Um, I think that's that's one more thing also to unpack for the for the future because at, at different um, evolution steps of your product and service you have you have these the different instances of value. Ultimately, uh, having the clean code, having the future proof architecture, having having the clear requirements, either contributes to added value for the customer in in, in the future, and there we are probably talking to an extent financial value. I also get 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 back to that in a while, or to more business value by having the internally, um, because you then in the future, if you have a future proof architecture, you need uh, less effort in the future to, to uh, evolve your product. And then um, I think that's, that's a whole new separate challenge to, to evolve our, um, and our uh, uh, entire network of KPIs where appropriate, mm -hmm. So that they are still aligned with the with the end purpose, and so and, and you can even can even put uh, to an extent financial value to something 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 like refreshment. So, for instance, ease of use. If you have two two apps, one is very easy to use, self-explanatory, and the other one is sort of terrible because you need to have many many clicks or need to tap one one specific area that you always miss or you always have to look up. How do I actually use this? Then of course you would go for the app that's much more refreshing to use, or, or where you would need less of uh, a sort of um, a downtime afterwards to recover from from using the app. So uh, and for the um, and as yeah sad as it actually is, organizations in the end live or die by the fiscal value. Um, but to maximize that, it's helpful to I consider all these other types of mm. types of value along the life cycle of a product or along the different types of operations they need to actually build and deliver and maintain a service or a product. But I think that's uh, probably a topic for an, an entirely different different session and one we, we haven't explored that much in depth. But there, one thing I recall from our discussions that there always also was a large level of confusion among our interviewees uh, about the so business value, customer value, how do they map and match and um, yeah, so that we, we actually couldn't go into, into much depth uh, uh, there because there wasn't that, that much clarity on the other side as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, as a matter of fact, that uh, has uh, energized me to write a book on the language of value. And uh, hopefully that will give us um, one step ahead to clarify the different domains of value and, uh, and look at value in a manner that's more um, more holistic, more broad, and hopefully that'll help us to then, uh, you know how it is, um, there's this joke that uh, when men name colors, they use words like red or blue or green. And when women uh, name colors, they use more precise notations like um, coral or peach or uh, fuchsia and, and, and so on. So therefore, very much like that, um, I believe that we perhaps need more precise names for different aspects of value. And therefore, with uh, this increased precision, we'll be able to be a little bit less confused and a bit more precise. Definitely. Yep. Andrea, so... And sorry, and one one other aspect I think that's uh, then even beyond that, what is sort of the the ultimate value uh, to society, especially with with a with with a digital service, because you can probably maximize the value for the customer, make them happy, maximize the value for the organization, so they are happy, and in the end, it will uh, still be uh, an over detriment to society uh, based on how 
also brains are, 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 are wired to, to deal with uh, finger digital information, digital overload, etc. Hmm. Um, just on that note, um, I've done some work, or Hori and I've done some work with some organizations when we would talk about value scoring, of which the monetary uh, component is just one of the dimensions. And it baffles people when we talk about value scoring in, in that context, you could see that it makes them feel really uncomfortable. Um, uh, that, that, that's what we found with some, with some organizations. I think that, 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 that also goes back to these, uh, or what's, what's baked in our established management instruments. Mm -hmm. Most of the time they've geared towards managing fiscal value or boiling everything down to that. And um, again, in, in the sort of Taylorism, that, that makes sense because there you measure efficiency in um, either, either time or sort of costs uh, that, you, that you want to actively minimize. And um, if, if that's the only thing you encounter during your education, and that's sort of and then the other part of my own profession, uh, how do we educate uh, future employees and future leaders? Um, that's probably. Um, also a bit of uh, a belated answer to, to one of the earlier points raised. If we introduce the notion of continuous change or of a nuanced perspective on value in the a basic university education for uh, sort of uh, business, uh, then I think we are also sort of contributing uh, to making these not totally foreign concepts that some part of sort of initial sort of practice shock uh, when our business graduates move into the work uh, uh, place and encounter totally totally different different things uh, as they've been they've been taught by us uh, in their initial education mm. let's move on a little bit um what other key findings uh that you find with your research i think we've covered most of them to an extent already. So one was the organizing for fluidity and change and the shift in, in verbs to, to indicate that. Um, it was that it's not about um, solving old problems and having no new problems. It's just a different, different way. So you you still have silos. It's just then every sort of product and service team, if that's the way you're organizing, is a new silo. Or if you have um, the a small digital unit and then the established organizational structure, then the so challenge is to sort of um, to minimize the friction between them. Um, you, you also have most of the time some kind of remnants of the established way of working because you can't change everything all the time. And then it's about managing the friction between the new way of working and the established way of working. Um, and one, one other thing was uh, that also came out at the very end, uh, there are a number of sort of tensions or the number of different paradoxes to sort of manage around uh, either during the regular operations or uh, during the start of, start of the journey. So for instance, if, if you take say organization needs the, uh, sees the change, sees the need to change and transform themselves, how do they get started? And one thing some organizations have done in the past and are surprisingly successfully is to do a big bang, to say, okay, now from sort of top down, we're saying in the future, we're going to be agile, full stop. And now we'd all tell you to self-organize, which is a nice, interesting paradox if you think about it so that you tell people now to self-organize. Mm -hmm. um, but at the, on the other hand, you need to have some way to overcome the initial inertia that any, every organization has against uh, why should we actually change and in which direction should we go initially. Um, so that's then uh, some, some other high level uh, sort of findings that we had that there are a number of uh, new tension and paradox uh, to organize around. And that's an, also something uh, we're actually going to uh, look at in the near future, a bit more in depth now that our organizations where we had done our research in had a few years uh, in a bit of a shifted environment, but so, so the sort, of, sort of nonetheless um, to uh, further mature in, in, these, in these new ways of working that we can, uh, that we hope that we can now take a bit of a deep dive in uh, unearthing and discussing these, these tensions, both those that uh, we bring to the table, but also that uh, they may, may have encountered others in their own specific way, uh, and that we can then keep asking other organizations also about um, 
to see what what's happened on on that space or so beyond the more uh, specific or first first order aspects as how do they now do architecting or how do they uh, have have their oversight uh, now thank you for that andreas i want to move on and look a little bit about the work that you've done and the work that um in, in the, the adaptive oversight space that that we've been um, exploring over the last, well, since 2020 or 2019. Um, can you um, explain a little bit uh, how your research integrates or uh, what are the parallels between your research and this exploration we've done with adaptive oversight? I think one, one key <clears throat> nice overlap is um, that this the tension idea that I just ended on is one key aspect in the adaptive oversight framework. So you have these sort of, sort of polar opposites uh, uh, at, in, in, the, in the inside circle and the outside circle. And then you have the sort of green path implying it's always about finding that right balance, but it's a wide green space, a wide green path. So you might uh, over, over time gravitate more towards the inside um, opposite or the, or the outside um, opposite. Um, and that's, I think, one thing that sort of sets this apart from, from um, other oversight approaches, which say this is the one stable way of getting good oversight. Uh, whereas here is, it's a continuous juggling effort of, what's it, six, six different? Um, yeah, uh, no, we've whittled it down to six. Yeah, six, six different stages. dimensions where yeah. you have to keep sort of juggling between the extremes. Um, and find something that's reasonably stable, but still open open to change. Um, so that's uh, so certainly one thing that sort of stands out and um, is so well aligned with, with the finding that we have. So you could say it's adaptive oversighting, uh, if, if that's a word, <laughs> Over, overseeing. Yeah, uh, so, so that's uh, how, how we would phrase it to, to emphasize this a continuous, Sort of sort of nature that it's that it's not uh, one one established uh, thing, but it's uh, yeah the the adaptive part says 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 it all. The the other thing is uh, so as I also hinted at, we found a few tensions or areas of tensions and area of paradoxes um, in our research, and uh, um, a number of them are actually here as well. So um, what we talked about before was the explore versus exploit. So at the um, at the top left, um, mm -hmm. explore and innovate versus maintain competent capability. Um, that's probably then the exploit uh, part, um, or the a personal versus organizational interest and and a purpose. That was one one other area because uh, if if you put the individual more front and center. Then this implies that you actually be serious about the notion of that not everyone's personal interest might be fully aligned with the organizational interest, which is perfectly normal. Uh, the the established um, way of working oftentimes has the unspoken assumption: we leave our home personality at home, and then we become the organizational uh, citizen uh, if we go to work, and that's that's part part of. Of the job and part of the of the payment that you leave your sort of home, home personality at home, um, and but if you bring the individual fully to the table, then this is a balancing interest. So um, new new learning, even it might not immediately benefit the organization, but can be helpful in the in, in the long term. Um, and one thing that's I think here under sort of a different terms is um the, the sort of co-evolution so where it's uh, mm. sort of top down versus bottom up versus lateral and i probably would put this under sort of trust versus control so top down means that the the leadership team is in full control over the organization is being run um and, and on the on the sort of flip side sort of trust um that a lot of things can be addressed within a team or between teams laterally, also bottom up, um, highlighted if, if uh, or escalated if, if um, 
then it's uh, if they need more resources etc but otherwise that they trust so there's there's one saying i like uh, you can have wild ducks but they need to fly information um and uh, that they trust that the that all their um uh, semi semi um autonomous teams keep flying to an extent in the formation with the overall organizational purpose and then the the sort of team uh, team team interests and where their emergence uh, or their journey of emergence uh, uh takes them i think that's that's uh, the the major things that that stand out um from uh, what we found and what's in here, in here uh, nicely but this goes actually further than um, things we looked at. So a safety versus coverage, that's I think one, one area that uh, we did, we hadn't really talked about, but at the same time, well, interviews are mainly um, those key figures who are in a bit more senior positions. Um, mm. And so they would, ha would also oftentimes part of, of their job description was the courage to push ahead to sort of champion the new way of working in the organization. And then we, we would have had, had to have a different uh, sort of research approach and different interview partners to actually talk about the, the actual extent between uh, feeling of safety in the changing environments versus the need or the versus the own courage that they felt to actually go ahead with uh, bringing ideas in uh, on, on their own. Thank you for that, Andreas. Um, I really, uh, it's it's interesting the exploit component here. Um, I appreciate that comment. Um, what have we missed? Uh, you, your research has done a really deep dive from a different perspective. And what have we missed from here? Um, so most of the things that are here, I think, one thing, but that maybe simply be 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 out of scope for um, uh, what what this framework is about. What I uh, hinted at before is how to get the whole journey rolling. So there is uh, other construct in academia called organizational inertia. That means it's pretty difficult to at least in uh, established organizations to get any interest into change unless the situation is sort of to totally uh, totally terrible and then everyone is happy everything will be better than what we have now otherwise it's uh, difficult to get this started and i gave the the example of that big bang to get the um, more self self-organizing journey um on the road and there are a number of other other things during the during the start. Once you are on, on the journey, then once you get this sort of ball rolling with within the green path, then it's it's sort of easy um, if you don't fall back into the rut uh, of, mm. of the old way of doing, um, which is another known phenomenon that when you um, set or set the external task of from please self-organize. I tell you to self-organize that this oftentimes essentially just ends and ends up replicating structures that have already been known. So that's that's yeah. uh, one one other thing that that can happen during the starts when you get these things rolling. Um, so that may be an an entirely different uh, sort of framework how to how to get onto this path and once you're onto the path then then you're fine well and these yep. two sorry andreas there's two components that um we have been practicing and we've been uh, experimenting with the first one is about the um how you charter this um and we we have a launch uh, a launching sequence if we if we can call it that of chartering this this journey to get it going and the other component is uh, there's quite a lot of very interesting work that was done by David Marquet that helps you uh, to establish the leadership inside the individuals, the leadership inside the individual teams in order to uh, disrupt themselves and to become self-organizing. And these are, these are a known set of practices that, that they teach in order to transition from give me the answers to we uh, we intend to do it this way uh, and we will we we will be doing yep. it this way so those are the two two things that um that that we've we've experimented with Aurea is giving a slight smile there because 
Um, he just returned from uh, Nashville in Tennessee, Agile 2022, uh, where he presented one component is about the chartering. Okay, thanks. You 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 said that there was a second thing before I yep. uh, interrupted and, you. And I think the the a second thing that you mentioned so goes along these these same lines. Um, so this is, um, yeah, uh, for for a lack of a, of a better word, about the sort of day to day BAU. Um, and uh, the the other thing you could probably have on a third dimension. So coming out of this here is what what a colleague of mine calls uh, the meta reorganization capability. So how good is the organization in actually sort of changing itself on all parts? So this 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 oversight, as we as we had um, worked out in the past, is uh, both of top down, bottom up, and laterally. And so these are all then the different players who have to have certain levels of the capability um, to keep the ball within the green path. Mm. both on the on the leadership level and on the team level and that's i think one thing that that could be easily added if we if, if it were easy to add a third dimension to a two-dimensional figure in a, in a on a two-dimensional piece of paper or or screen um, so this uh, meta reorganization capability how good are we at all these things and probably more that we need um to be able to hold our our balance between all these six things at the same time and it's not a not a stable balance it sort of shall not be a stable balance so it's it's it. sort of in here but at the same time it's if if you take a step back and look at not one of these six segments at a time but at all six segments at the time um how good is an organization on all levels and actually uh, living this idea, so to speak. Mm. So that would be my second thing. And I think some of the things that, that you mentioned uh, before fits off nicely, nicely into that building, the capability to actually have the uh, adaptive oversight or the uh, adaptive overseeing. Thank you for that. And Horia, you look quite reflective there. Yeah, um, one thing that we haven't made um, obvious here is the, the balance between the Agile Triangle and the Iron Triangle. Um, in a previous podcast, we explored the concept that to make it a bit more easily understood by the layperson, we might call it a balance between value on the one hand, <laughs> that's the Agile Triangle uh, primary intention, and conformance. Um, um, uh, that would be the, the iron um, triangle. In other words, uh, the iron triangle is more interested in conforming to constraints, um, be on time, on budget, um, on scope, mm -hmm. whereas the agile triangle is more interested in achieving great value with good quality, right? So it's on value, on quality, within constraints. So value versus conformance is uh, an interesting aspect there. But I like very much um, this emphasis on, on dynamic balance because another thing that is a side effect of our usual um, culture, shall we say, is this idea of things are static. We're coming back to the farrier, if you will. The context is the same, the horse is the same, the challenge is the same. And therefore, um, in that context, you have a solution and the solution is set and you don't have to dynamically adapt. Because the thing is, um, horses, while they change and they continue to evolve over time, they don't change all that much um, within a normal lifespan. So um, what we have on our hands with uh, this volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, you were mentioning VUCA um, earlier, is we have a lot more dynamism in the world around us. So therefore, what we're 
the main message that we're proposing here is that you cannot have a well set best practice for yep. oversight. Yeah, you have to have some form of emergent uh, adaptation of oversight that is sensible and responsible. It pays attention to what is actually going on, and it recruits more capabilities, more assets uh, in service of achieving its intentions as needed by the environment. So for instance, we may have a product that we invent and whoa, it's a fabulous product. And hey, uh, then for a while, that product may enjoy an um, undisputed leadership for quite a period of time. Now, when you have that situation and the product is kind of slow and steady, the need for oversight kind of diminishes because, hey, you make another 57,000 um, of the things and you're good. People still keep buying it. But if you start to have then some competition, some pressure, um, you could think of it as evolutionary pressure. Um, then all of a sudden you need to adjust, you need to adapt. It's very interesting that in biology, uh, this kind of situation happens uh, over and over again. Uh, I'm reminded of some interesting research around snails. Uh, there were some snail populations um, in the UK uh, where this was um, noticed. Um, when there's not much predator pressure, and uh, snails kind of multiply uh, happily to their own devices, it's very interesting that um, you tend to have more females in the population and, and fewer males. So therefore there's a little bit less variation uh, genetically. But when you start to introduce predator uh, pressure, what happens through mechanisms that we don't really understand yet is all of a sudden the ratio of males to females in the population changes dramatically um, in the direction of males and that introduces a lot more genetic variation so all of a sudden you have um, it's like nature is testing different options different abilities to see can this survive better can this survive better can this survive better um, and in this way, uh, you're hoping to counterbalance that increased um, competition and evolutionary uh, pressure and achieve a better, a better outcome. So um, in the idea of biomimicry, kind of learning from, from nature, I wonder if we couldn't uh, take a lesson from nature and uh, from an oversight perspective, be mindful of what's happening. Where are these competitors that are coming to... Um, prey on our customers right and yeah. and uh, remove them from us and therefore how do we evolve how do we change how do we have more intense uh, oversight when that happens and therefore more rapidly change the product and the offering such that it, um, it it stays ahead of the competition or at least keeps pace with it such that we we sustain a, a thriving business and that actually it reminds me of one analysis by another colleague because we academics love our sort of terms and definitions and sort of concepts. And what, what they've looked at is this sort of um, agile way of organizing actually anything new uh, compared to what other uh, similar concepts already exist in the literature? Or is this just basically sort of things pieced together? And one thing they found was the only new thing is sensing at speed. So all other things are there, explore, exploit, and the need to sense and to respond and to be focused on, on as a value, et cetera. But one thing that hasn't really been sort of conceptualized in the past in research was bringing together speed and the external perspective and the sensing. So when you, when you say, uh, when our product is doing fine, we might not feel we need that much oversight, but this will tell us actually we do uh, so that we can sense at speed if others uh, may be onto something and that we start reacting before it sort of happens to us and that, that we are prepared. And uh, I think that that's so nice, nice it, um, goes also into the sort of value part on the, on the agile triangle uh, is to be actively on the prowl if we, keep our sort of metaphors in, in nature and uh, to, um, yeah, so, so not to become prey, but to stay a little bit predatorial as an, as an, as an enterprise 
um, and sort of keep sort of pushing the competitors at the same time. Because when you yeah. slightly innovate, then you're keeping also your your potential competitors on the, on their toes. Instead of when you send the the signal of stability, then they have a reasonably easy time working working around uh, uh, you and uh, so sort of trying to one up uh, what what you're doing. So I think that's that's one um, interesting aspect of this of this sort of value value part sensing at speed. Yeah, one thing that came to mind for me is it's not just about keeping the um, opponents or um, predators at bay, if you will, but also about partners. In other words, if I'm accustomed to innovating and improving myself in a certain uh, fashion with a certain pace, then I'm expecting that my partners will keep pace um, with us as well, rather than them being a little bit more lazy and so on. So if I'm wanting to get stronger and better, I'm expecting my partners to do the same. I'm reminded of um, highly effective, lean communities where you're actively teaching not only your own facilities how to become more effective, to operate with less waste, with um, uh, better learning on the job and so on, you know, and on cords and, so, uh, and, and such, but deliberately you cultivate um, a coaching cadre that goes and teaches all of your um, upstream vendors, if you will, the same kinds of disciplines and approaches because it doesn't uh, do me enough good if I'm focused on really great quality, really great capability and fit, but my upstream vendors are failing to demonstrate sufficient uh, discipline and capability in that same space. So that's, again, something quite, uh, quite fascinating to me in um, figuring out how do we do this in knowledge work as well? How do we inspire our upstream vendors, if you will, our um, community that we, co we collaborate with to develop more insightful and effective ways of oversight and, and governance. And I think this this could maybe even be something um, as a, either sort of part of a framework or simply implicitly. Um, so if we have the mindset of let's apply this to our own organization versus having the mindset, let's apply this to the entire part of the ecosystem where this is relevant. And I think these are two totally different tasks. The former one doing this within one enterprise is something where organization might be reasonably skilled at uh, when, when there's a veterans of internal change and reorganization now for years and decades, uh, some more, some, some are less successful probably, versus applying this idea of adaptive balancing across organizational um, boundaries in all directions so supply chain but also then partners um or the, the platform or what whatever the relevant parts of your of your own ecosystem is and then this is a wholly new game and i'm not sure many organizations would be in any way skilled or comfortable in either being on the sending side or on the receiving side of suddenly having someone else being sort of telling them what to do. Um, I think the only ones who are maybe the suppliers of large car organizations, and they certainly don't like that uh, if GM or Volkswagen are sort of telling them how to produce and so what to do and how to cut even more costs. So even the existing examples in that space are probably not the best role models to follow. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if we sort of take this, this, this ecosystem centric perspective to heart, then, then probably also have our work cut out for the foreseeable future to establish that. Absolutely. Now, um, in closing, what haven't we asked you that uh, we should have? That's always a dangerous question to ask in the day, <laughs> you know? Um, but I think by and large, I couldn't really think of anything in particular that's uh, worth going through um, that we haven't done. I'm just looking at my cheat slides. So we had the ecosystem, we had the top down, we had the governing uh, part, the fluidity and change. Uh, yeah, I think this is, makes a nice round package. We have the idea of the tension and the paradoxes uh, baked in. Um, the uh, Maybe the only the only blind spot that that we had, but that's maybe a bit sort of too too specific for such a general framework is um, that 
um, the aspect of security, so digital security, product service security, uh, was something we, even we had 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 overlooked on our own and had never come up either in our interviews. Um, and uh, with uh, the ever increasing importance of that in digital products or services, um, that's our one one thing or one of the things on our uh, to do list for the for the next round to ask that. Uh, in addition to doing a deep dive into uh, the how they manage the tension and tensions and paradoxes uh, yeah. Um, yeah. that could have been here but at the same time it's a bit out of focus for this uh, high level adaptive oversight framework but i thought i'd simply simply throw this in for good measure yeah i think that's a really good um, emphasis because again it depends very much on the the nature of your business because if you happen to be uh, operating with software intensive systems, then yes, digital security is an essential aspect. But uh, the oversight um, approach is not geared only at digital um, organizations. The oversight elements are equally applicable no matter what you may be um, engaged in in creating. Now, I would suggest that this idea of digital security is a specific engineering aspect, very much like code quality um, and technical debt. Uh, they are uh, similar challenges in the maintenance of a, of a healthy software intensive system. It, it ties into value. So, of course, um, at having at least a minimum level of a security is something the customer would at least expect to pay for without asking for it. Only when they have the first breach, uh, then uh, um, this this issue is being raised. It also ties into other values such as speed, because you're of course faster developing a first MVP that's totally unsecure than one where you already at least build the possibility to make it secure later into the basic architecture. But at the same time, the latter one will take you further if, if a product is uh, successful. So um, yeah, it's, it's uh, one, of, one of these more detailed value considerations, as, as you said, such as, such as code quality or the, the, the architectural fitness for purpose um, mm. that needs to be part of the, of the operational oversight process. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's a very good catch, um, actually. Because I wonder then, if we have a specific taxonomy of such um, um, concerns in a similar vein, if you will. Um, so just as we we have this concern about security, I'm I'm having an intuition that perhaps it's not just digital security; it's also a range of other uh, concerns in the same general field shall we say. So yeah. that might be worth exploring um, at some stage. Yeah, it's yeah. really, really cool. So mindset or sort of culture. So if, if everyone has a basic concern of the overall architecture, so what I do now, how does this impact others uh, along the food chain? Uh, and the same uh, do, do, do I think of at least the basic security uh, and does everyone else. So again, we are back to the co, co sort of oversight. Um, uh, as long as someone thinks of it, then everyone is probably going to be fine. But how can we ensure that at least someone thinks of it? Yeah, um, yeah. And that's that. These these all all all, all these subordinate concerns um, under value. So inc uh, including code quality, including security, including architecture fit for purpose, inc including ease of use, etc. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's excellent. So therefore, that brings to mind the idea that in addition to the um, sixth dimension of the adaptive oversight um, Rosetta, we also have the necessity or the possibility of some additional setup um, elements. Like in an organization, if you were to take a systematic, deliberate um, view of how do we improve our oversight? Yes, we need to look at those six dimensions, but we might also need to identify specific domain areas or domain characteristics that we uh, pay attention to, like, for instance, digital security um, in, in the case here. So that's an area well worth uh, looking into to say when we're overseeing a particular initiative, what kinds of questions should we ask around code quality, digital security, 
um, uh, market penetration, um, um, competitor intelligence, and, and so on. Brand image, yeah. So all the all these kind of values, so not yeah. the value, but the values uh, that are part of part of the corporate culture, corporate identity, um, and um, maybe even part of the mission. Yeah. So I think that's that's something nice, nicely complementary. Uh, to explore for the future, where do want organizations want to sort of sort of position themselves also to to attract certain, certain talent uh, as well, uh, oh, not just have yeah. the normal typical hello mission statements that no one really knows and cares mm -hmm. about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> you've you've hit on a on a bugbear of ours. Uh, we we're passionate about chartering, so when chartering, we deliberately say right. Everybody, you've heard what the boss said, right? Or you've seen what the what the, um, the vision statement for the organization is now. We're going to make our own for this initiative in this particular context. What do we believe is our mission here, right? So that way you give people an opportunity to articulate something that's really meaningful, that, that they're uh, really passionate about. So um, that, I think, has been tremendously helpful. Uh, Andreas, thank you so much for your time and Thank you uh, for the generous invitation. insights yeah and uh look forward to seeing you again um in the future uh, after the next round of, of research and hear more of your uh discoveries for sure uh that's one nice thing about us as, as, as academics we love to talk about our findings <laughs> good stuff <laughs> Andrea, right. uh, thank you very much for your time and we really uh, appreciate you sharing your some of your research um and we will, um, if you've got something that uh, you want to make available that we can uh, publish with the, uh, the recording, um, we'd be happy to share uh, anything that, that you may want to share uh, to be published. Okay, I'll certainly will have a think about that. Otherwise, it was a very fun uh, a conversation and insightful and it went really fast uh, at least on my end that's the same going to be for the viewers uh, yeah and again uh, thanks for having me thank you very much i'm aldu and i'm horia bye bye bye